Hey guys, Metacosis Perfectionalis is back, continuing our playlist called Pulmonology. Today we will talk about sarcoidosis, the most common non-infectious granulomatous disease in the United States. It can cause restrictive lung disease and restrictive cardiomyopathy and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, uveitis and others. With that being said, now let's get started. Definition, it's a chronic disease. If it started yesterday, it's not sarcoidosis. Immune-related, multi-system granulomatous disease, characterized by the presence of non-infectious, non-caseating granulomas, plus chronic interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. As you see, pulmonary fibrosis and hyalur lymphadenopathy, and the hyalur lymphadenopathy contains non-caseating granuloma. The exam question will describe a non-smoker, African-American female in her 20s or 30s with interstitial lung disease and systemic symptoms and non-caseating granuloma. If it doesn't involve the lungs, it's not sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is the most common non-infectious granulomatous disease, represent 25% of cases of chronic interstitial pulmonary disease. It's more common in women and more common in blacks. Pathophysiology. Immune dysregulation. The problem could be in chromosome 6 involving MHC and non-MHC genes. There is unknown antigen. For some unknown reason, starts to interact with CD4 positive T helper cells. They say that this is possibly airborne. That's why the lungs are always involved. CD4 T helper cell will release cytokine to communicate with other white blood cells, leading to formation of non caseatum granuloma. And the main cell here is the epithelioid histiocyte, which is a freaking macrophage. Some theories suggest that this unknown antigen could be a pesticide, mold, or cat G mycobacterial protein. The macrophages and the granuloma will synthesize 1 alpha hydroxylase. As you know, 1 alpha hydroxylase activates 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is like just 1 hydroxy, into 125, that's why we call it 1 alpha hydroxylase, 1 and 25 dihydroxy vitamin D. This is also known as vitamin D3. This is also known as the active form of vitamin D. This will lead to hypercalcemia. Why? Because it increased calcium absorption in the GIT and calcium reabsorption in the kidney, especially at the distal convoluted tubule, particularly at the principal cell. If there is hypercalcemia, there will be hypercalcuria. If there is hypercalcuria, you have an increased risk of calcium kidney stones. Kidney stones are very painful. The question will describe them as a patient with sudden severe pain, like 10 out of 10 or something. It's really bad. Organ involvement in sarcoidosis. The lung is always involved because the antigen is probably airborne, and this will lead to granuloma. Sarcoidosis is all about the non caseating granuloma thanks to CD4 positive T helper cell. That's why we can do a test called CD4 to CD8 ratio, and CD4 are always higher in number than CD8. That's why the ratio is four to one or greater. So five over one, six over one, stuff like that. Hyalur lymph nodes, you have bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy, and there is non kgt granuloma in the lymph nodes. These hyalur lymph nodes eventually will drain into the mediastinal lymph nodes. You can see mediastinal lymphadenopathy, brain, cranial nerve palsies, and meningitis. I, uveal tracts, especially uveitis. What is the uveal tract? Three things, choroid, iris, and ciliary body. You can have inflammation in all of them. Optic nerve fibers problem can lead to glaucoma. So whenever I'm reading an exam question and they describe a patient as an African-American female who is 25 year old, with a glaucoma and she's coughing, it's sarcoidosis. Before I even finish the question. Lacrimal glands and salivary glands. You can have lacrimal gland granuloma, enlarged lacrimal or salivary glands, including parotid enlargement. Hard, you can have myocarditis, pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Again, sarcoidosis can lead to two restrictive problems, restrictive lung disease and restrictive cardiomyopathy. Arrhythmia, AV block, and sudden death. In both restrictive cardiomyopathy and restrictive lung disease, the organ is restricted from filling. 
In the bone, you'll see phalangeal bone cysts. In the bone marrow, you can see leukoerythroblastosis. My mnemonic is that the bone marrow has become crazy and stupid. What do you mean? I mean immature red blood cells and immature white blood cells. And when the RBCs are immature, they will have a nucleus. So this is leukoerythroblastosis in a nutshell. Why do you see leukoerythroblastosis and sarcoidosis? Because those ugly granulomas have invaded the bone marrow. Those granulomas can infiltrate the spleen leading to splenomegaly, liver, granulomatous hepatitis, and the most common cause of non-infectious hepatitis in the United States is sarcoidosis. Nervous system, you can see meningitis or encephalitis. Joints, you can see arthritis. Skin is a big deal. You have erythema nodosum or subcutaneous nodules or lupus pernia. Erythema nodosum has an N. It's a noble lesion, so it has a good prognosis. Pernia, on the other hand, is a pernicious lesion. It has a poor prognosis. Let's talk about erythema nodosum first. Painful nodules in the lower extremities, especially over the shin of the tibia. These nodules are really painful. You see them in sarcoidosis and you see them in inflammatory bowel disease, among others. They are commoner in females than males. If you take a biopsy, you'll see subcutaneous fat inflammation and it carries good prognosis. Subcutaneous nodules containing the non-caseating granuloma. Can you mention another disease that has subcutaneous nodules without non-caseating granuloma? If you say rheumatic fever, you are absolutely correct. And the N in the Jones criteria is the subcutaneous nodules. Lupus pernia is violaceous, like this, violet in color. Rash on nose and cheeks carries poor prognosis. Others, you can find central diabetes insipidus, and we called it insipidus literally because the urine is insipid, which means tasteless, because it's very diluted. Because you are a young person who was born yesterday. Back in the good old days, which were not good, doctors used to taste the urine to differentiate between diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus. In diabetes mellitus, it was sweet urine, but in diabetes insipidus, it was insipid. If it's central, the serum ADH is low. This is decreased secretion. Treatment, give the ADH. It's called desmopressin or DDAVP. Kidney stones can happen. This is called nephrocalcinosis. These are calcium kidney stones. Nerves, you can have peripheral neuropathy leading to tingling, numbness, dull aching pain in the hands the, you know the nerve problem symptoms of sarcoidosis include cough and dyspnea like any respiratory disease uveitis can lead to blurry vision if you have hypercalcemia you will have stones groans thrown psychiatric overtones and i might add phone what do you mean by phone i mean call 911 because it can lead to acute pancreatitis Stones, I mean calcium kidney stones, groans, constipation, abdominal pain, thrones, urinary frequency, psychiatric overtone, I mean anxiety, and you phone if you have acute pancreatitis. Symptoms of pericarditis include sharp, non-pleuritic, substernal chest pain, decreases when bending forward, and also decreases when you hold your chest tightly, but the pain increases when you lie down in bed because when you lie down, you are stretching the pericardium and it's going to hurt. Pericarditis will have triphasic friction rub. This is different from pleuritis or pleurisy because pleurisy has only biphasic friction rub. Why biphasic? Because inhalation, exhalation. That's it. Why is pericarditis triphasic? Because there is systole, early diastole, and late diastole. Signs in sarcoidosis. If there is dyspnea, there is tachypnea. You'll find inspiratory crackles. You can find friction rub. If it's pericarditis, triphasic. If it's pleurisy, biphasic. If you hold your breath, the biphasic friction rub will disappear. But if you hold your breath, your heart is still pumping. The triphasic is not disappearing. Abnormal ophthalmological exam because of the uveitis, you might have corneal opacities or glaucoma when you see the fundus of the eye. Complications of sarcoidosis, you can get interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, you can get core pulmonary because of the lung fibrosis. The right heart cannot pump blood easily against this lung. They will lead to pulmonary artery hypertension, then right ventricular hypertrophy. After right ventricular hypertrophy, you'll have jugular venous distension, you'll have ankle edema, and you will have liver distension because of the distending capsule of Gleason. 
This is due to increase the hydrostatic pressure, one of the stalling forces, and this edema is a transudate, it's not an exudate. My favorite part of the lecture, sarcoidosis always involves the lung. Sarcoidosis causes restrictive cardiomyopathy and restrictive lung disease. The organ is restricted from filling. The most common non-infectious granular disease in the United States is sarcoidosis. The most common cause of non-infectious hepatitis is sarcoidosis. The most commonly involved organ is the lung. The most common symptom is dyspnea. The most common eye abnormality is uveitis. You'll find bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy, but they tend to disappear as the disease progresses. In TB, TNF-alpha maintains your granuloma, which is caseating granuloma in case of tuberculosis. It's cheesy. Aspergilloma usually arises in previous lung cavities, on top of TB, on top of sarcoidosis, or on top of other lung infections, such as histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, coccidioidomycosis, or paracoccidioidomycosis. Who named these things? In sarcoidosis, if you see erythema nodosum, it's noble. If you see lupus pernio, it's pernicious. By the way, the typical case of sarcoid is called Lofgren syndrome, and this is an African-American female in her 20s or 30s having interstitial pulmonary disease, bilateral hyaluronic lymphadenopathy, erythema nodosum, and uveitis. You already have your diagnosis. There is no need to perform a biopsy. And as your grandpa said, if the diagnosis is clinical, there is no need to be hysterical. Cold worker pneumoconiosis does not involve the hilum. Silicosis does involve the hilum, and you'll see actual calcification of the hilar lymph node. Sarcoidosis does involve the hilum, and you'll find bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. These contain the non caseating granuloma. In a previous video in this glorious playlist, I've compared between hypersensitivity pneumonitis and sarcoidosis. Please watch that video. If you have already watched that video, please try to fill in the blank to train your mind because memory is like a muscle. You have to exercise it. You want a better memory? Use your memory. Thank you so much for watching. I am honored. Please subscribe, hit the bell and smash like. Follow me on Facebook or Instagram. I have 100 cases on Facebook. You can get the slides of these videos. You can get my premium videos, my cases, my post notes, my PDF notes, my audio notes, organized in Dropbox folders at patreon.com slash medicosis. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.